Yeah, ho. Testing, testing. And this is Terrence Borns with another fantasy file read. This one is titled Romeo. Prediction date February the 17th, 2017. The characters in this one are Terrence Prescott, Rafun Runzo, Universe, Equion Doza, Jubilation Lay, Twistel, and Mac. Those characters are from different stories of mine and whatnot. Troubled Kingdoms, Twistel would be from. The Real Be For Real, Mac would be from. Behind the Door, Jubilation Lay. Remixed, Equian Doza. And the real be for real again universe. If you don't remember, Rafon Runzo comes from a fantasy file titled True, the one that took place in the world of Remnant. And now, this is something that happened after he got to the home universe of TPB. This fantasy will revolve around Rafon Runzo and the deadly magical forest event. Butterflies with curses that will turn your body orange and a dozen times of a dozen flutters are not to be taken lightly. We go camping with his rugby team for some odd reason, but we both bring weapons and fulfill the Romeo National Forest of the TPB plate for a good week during the fiasco. This is seven months after his lame ass comes to my universe and already has made a name for himself. After giving him funds and giving him restitution for taking time from his world into mine, he is still in school learning about the Trilstone era, but he has successfully infiltrated the Intergalactic Rugby League, also buying out a team, grounds, and making an identity for himself within five months. This month is a break from all of it, but gets sideswiped even though Universe and Equian those are both on his rugby team. They have come up in the ranks to a whopping 12 before the fall season begins. It begins... After the ridiculous months of the new order of imagination for story number one, the order, I was able to deal with invasions from sources that wanted me to do the opposite of that. Rafun Runzo, the chubby, muscly Dominican who came from the world of Remnant to start a life of immortality with me, is still by my side, but in a completely different way. His findings from his past life damn near quadrupled since moving to the perfect world. I don't know how he has made a living that quick in a world of strangers, but he did, especially with Universe and Equia and Doza, endorsing him. He has successfully made grounds, a stadium, and several other venues of promise. A successful man he is. He even owns his rugby team, the Red Bandicoots. He is also the head captain of the team. He has both Universe and Equia on his team as strong contenders that back up their abilities to profusely cause onslaughts on the field. After making a team in a good three months, he got them into the Intergalactic League, having them ranked at number 12 at the end of the preseason qualifiers. I didn't hear the end of that for weeks. But leading him slowly to excess of the Crimson Quilt, he made his own path within the Trostone era. I can't help but to be proud of him, but it's the month before the fall season to gear up. We have a lot of time before he dives headfirst into his business again before Pride of Week and before anything also sparks up. That anything else happens to be a little camping trip for his team, associates, and significant others. Talking about he has a surprise for me. I did not want all this. The summertime is too hot for camping and I don't want to smell my balls for a week like this. Hardy hard 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 filled the air for quite some time during that day he brought it up. All day Random texts of laughing faces. All day, straight faces from me. When we finally saw each other that day, I couldn't even be furious with him because I walked into the bar to him saying, take these three shots back to back, right away. I said okay by the time 7 p.m. came around. I didn't know what I was about to get into, but I got into it. Into some real brave shit. Want to read how it went? Well, here it go. In a land of imagination, where hearts go boom. Where blades make music, where bullets bend lives, where miracles make everything blow. I find myself looking at a bag of 30 headbands, 
because the temperature was already blazing in the atmosphere of Romeo National Park. I checked the weather so much over the next week that I knew I was thankful for three days where there would be rainstorms. Over the long, joyous flight, the wives and significant others enjoyed their time together as the team congregated elsewhere to do more team bonding for the coming season. I was by myself with a few of my characters. We started playing around with Hennessy and Uno, ultimate shit-talking in our own little world. Jubilation Lay, Twistel, and Mac kept my mind off of the dreadful heat to be because we were too deep into murdering each other with 14 card combos at a time. We spent hours taking shots, just letting things settle, and as our frustrations and hatred for each other winning every other match settled in. So did the booze. Before we were told we'd be landing, we all tried to stand up super slow because we killed three bottles of Hennessy and a bottle of root beer before the games were over. We laughed our asses off as we got back to our seats. Then Rafoon gave me this hilarious look like I played too much. I did nothing wrong. I had to get hot before I got bothered by the heat of this climate. Sometime later, we were hiking through a lot of Romea to get to our camp. It was a mighty 12 mile hike, but a lot of us were happy that our bags would be there way before we got there and we would get lifted out of there instead of having to walk the 12 miles back. Along the way, we saw a mad load of butterflies swarming through the trees, up and down, just fluttering beautifully. If not as many as all of us, it was a tad bit more. We all found a weird that so many butterflies met up with us during the hike. So many colors, so many species of them. Their size were a bit scary though. They were at least the size of my heart, almost a tad bit bigger with the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen on butterflies. At one point, things took a drastic turn because they were still swarming around the forest, around us, as if we were invading on their territory. I'm not sure if it was me or not, but I had a psychic double check, triple check to see if I was seeing things. I swore I saw one of the orange ones stop for way too long, land on air without moving anything but its antennas, then started fluttering again. My intuition didn't give me any kind of negative energy, but I just wanted to cause a ruckus about it, but nobody else seemed to see what I saw. Then, let's keep on hiking, you blind asses. And then there it was, a magical huge kingdom of a tent. It was monstrous with a huge shaded deck that looked over Rebel Lake. The wooden deck was all black, with furniture that made it seem like a fire was happening. All of the tents were peach color with red tip tops and luscious green flags on top of them. The park's flags was at the top of the highest part of the tent. It was diamond checkered in greens with a green of fedora that had a red feather in it. The entrances to the giant tent had luscious shimmering black nets over them, with yellow hexagon mats leading everyone to a two-story complex under the tent and the deck. It looked like a little colony with exquisite taste. The architecture for this campground was everything but campground. Yet, Everyone's room has dirt in it with a couple of cots in them. All we had to do was set things up and put our sleeping bags across the cots. All of our belongings were already in the right rooms because the vans got here sometime before us. After everyone got adjusted, they started to go their separate ways like down to the lake, chill out on the deck, get something to eat from the grill area, go to the treehouse, walk around inside of the built-in track under the tent, and around the rooms or to take a nap. The rest of that warm day was like dead until dusk. Everyone gathered for the first steak dinner as savory amounts of them, plus the appropriate sides, were delivered to us. A huge meeting was going down as we were being served on the deck. The captains, the coaches, and major supporters were preparing to let us know what the entire week would hold. We were all ears as our tongues were all utensils. We were informed that the week would hold a water balloon war, a water gun war, scavenger hunt, Lazy Day 1, Lazy Day 2, an all-day hike and an impressively ridiculous obstacle course. Eventually, through the preparation, I kept seeing more butterflies flutter throughout the area. I kept thinking they need to take a chill pill before the sun sets. Then one landed on the giant parasail of my table. It was like it was looking at me. I threw a napkin at it to get it to fly away. It took it a while before it left my range of vision. At the end of the meeting, we were all given brochures of our little vacation, and then we jokingly said that some people wanted to hear their own voices. Official Weekly Schedule Tuesday, 1. 
Mediterranean food, the water balloon war, fireworks over the late Wednesday, two. American food, lazy day one. Thursday, three. Asian food, the obstacle course to end all obstacle courses. Paint a tree before midnight. Friday, four. Mexican food, the scavenger hunt, water skiing. Saturday, five. Carnival food, lazy day two. Sunday, six. Alcoholics food, in the water gun war. Monday, seven. Seafood, an all day hike. Tuesday, eight. Pancakes for everybody. Farewell, tree carving. And bye bye. It all seemed good as we all silently went into the night to be adults about it. Rafoon and I went down to the dock with Twistel. We got a case of beers, so we had six to down. We got to a good spot off the shore where we could dangle our feet and have our feet underwater. That allowed us to stay cool as the alcohol was bound to encourage heat. We got comfortable as fireflies filled the sights across the lake within the trees and behind us. Everything looked good and sounded good. A jamboree started and the bass was booming so good it made us dance with our feet in the water. We started talking about the vastness of universes and the last species of aliens that came in the terrain of the Tristone era. They weren't such good beings, but they weren't difficult to deal with. I had all of their ships eaten by our most giant monsters. All of us and them were congratulated heavily as they literally saved us with so much ease. It was comical at how the monsters wanted more space vessels to eat. And side note, Olamis is one of my characters that has monster as a superpower, which means she can summon them, she can control them, tame them to do whatever bidding she wants, has a psychic connection to all of them, and I think she has rainbow, I think her superpower is rainbow monster, which means she is incredibly off the chain. Now back to the story. Then we started talking about the universal sign of care. Twistel said it was putting her arms out and signaling for a hug. Rafoon said something along the lines of turning around and walking away. Granted, that's something I would do in any situation, but since I'm not a completely heartless being, hugging was the right answer. We wondered what those beetle-shaped aliens looked like when they went for hugs or if they could even. Then both Twistel and Rafoon wanted a hug from me because I gave the best hugs. I laughed so hard, but I had to get up to hug Rafoon. I sat behind him and hugged him just to complete his life again. Then Twistel kept laughing at Rafoon's face to the point we both had to laugh because she was literally laughing forever. We were lame like that for an hour before we decided to get up to return to our rooms. Day 1 Rafoon woke up before me to go on a job with the team, but before he did, he kissed my gleaming head as he escaped without a sound. Took him a while to learn how to get out of bed without making noise, but keeping his spirit around gradually so I don't wake up right away. I eventually get up to go out on the deck to get breakfast like everyone else, but they said we might as well get some exercise in there. I was surrounded by the lovers of the rugby team. He wanted to do yoga. I didn't have a problem with that. We balanced all like Dominique dolls, then got some fruity breakfast with Hennessy drenched smoothies that felt like a magic carpet waiting to happen. Through all, all of that, I saw a couple of butterflies who were completely content with sitting on a rail overlooking the lake. People got close to them and they even took selfies with them. They were mad comfortable and no one bothered them, but they bothered me. Jubilation lady wanted me to stop having a problem, but they were creeping, mad creeping. Then the stampede of the rugby team came back as the last fellow got his smoothie. They went immediately into getting their breakfast and joining us. As they were filing into the tabled area, the workers were already setting up to get us started with the water balloon wall. Whatever section everyone was sitting in meant they were on that table. My dumb ass was sitting in the orange area. The areas were divided into seven. Yeah, there were that many of us. The seven colors of the rainbow. I wanted to Twistel and Jubilation lay on my team because they have accuracy, but wanted Mac to not be on my team. I didn't get lucky because I was set up with Mac and the two ladies were on two different teams. They kept looking at me with sad faces and we couldn't do anything about it because no one was allowed to switch seats. They didn't want to either because mostly everyone was with their lover or their friends. Then the rules of the water balloon war started to be relayed to us, but first, all of the team captains. Indigo team, Jubilation Lady, Purple team, Equiandosa, Blue team, Universe, 
Green team, some guy named James Tower. Yellow team, Twistel. Orange team, Terrence with Raffoon and Mac. Red team, some guy named Desanal Junan. There will be highly dyed water within each balloon. With there being seven colors, you can guess that mixes will be made and that will get in the way of counting up points because everyone will be wearing white. They will be forced into safe zones to change clothes every time anyone gets tagged. The team with the most dyed clothing will win the war. With there being so many hours in a day, there will be eight heats with 30 minute breaks between each heat. There will be big necklaces for each team. There will be food and minister close to safe zones, and everyone will get maps of the areas of the water balloon war. Fair enough. All the orange team had to do was drench everyone as quick as possible. Then they brought in a wild card, talking about they weren't done yet. Each hour of the war had a specific theme, so that everyone can have an opportunity to excel. I was not amused with the themes at all. All of the water balloon war themes. Hour one, odd man out. One person cannot throw balloons at all, and that person will be symbolized by wearing boxing gloves, so they obviously cannot retrieve or throw water balloons. Hour 2. Rope riding activated. All over the forest, there are ropes that anyone can hang from. They have buckets of their tin color on them. Only two people can be on those ropes at once, because of all of the water weight and two beings being on a rope. Hour 3. Blindfold me. There will be one person on each team with a blindfold. This can be tricky because a blindfolded person has to be accompanied by someone and guided back to safe zones to reset. Hour 4. Water cannons activated. In this round, there will be water cannons scattered about that can help drench enemies from afar. Occupy them carefully so you don't give your cover away. Hour 5. Eliminate hour. In this round, hiding is allowed, which allows anyone to stay in safe zones if they want to rest the whole hour. But this also means if you get hit, you can't get any more points the rest of the hour. Hour 6. Limited ammo hour. Every team has 100 balloons. Use them wisely. Hour 7. Double point hour. The die is doubled in the water balloons during this hour. More points, better point variation. And then the final hour. Triple point hour. The die is so thick in the water that it's super obvious. Good luck. I was wet all day, not only from getting tagged, but being the team scapegoat, just to run all willy-nilly to draw other teams. I ran so much I had to be wheelchaired into the night ceremony. The orange team didn't win because the captain was on my team. Raffoon stuck a middle finger up at every team because they made sure the orange team didn't win. It was all laughs. We got fourth place. Equion's purple team got third. Twister's yellow team got second, and Jubilation Lace Indigo team got first. The first day was their day, but it was all in good fun. Then we all went to go jump in a lake to use bio-friendly soap as they started our hour-long fireworks ceremony. Nobody cares about the nudity too much because we saw all kinds of body parts earlier because everyone kept changing while trying to get into changing sections and came out not completely covered just to get back into the war. Hilarious times as magic filled it out. Day 2. I'm glad this was a lazy day. They said today would be the hottest of the time we were on this trip. Because of the forest, we were shaded most of the time, but it was so hot. Mostly everyone was at the lake. It was so hot. The entire rugby team was smiling because they didn't do any rigorous activity. It was so hot. No one wanted to touch each other. Yet them burgers and hot dogs were so damn delicious. Made me hungry for some hanky-panky, but it was so hot into the night. Not a single person were all the way into their sleeping bag until 3 a.m. Day 3. We woke up to more heat. The rugby team going on a jog and some Asian delicacies. Their sushi was so cold, it was what everyone needed. But with another competition in the hour, we were forced to stay on the colored teams of the other day. As soon as I saw Mick, I told him that I didn't want any bullshit. But that was after he got done doing 1,000 full body lifts while hanging underneath the main deck of the campgrounds. Everyone was wondering where he went, but we couldn't hear him grunting below because he was so far away. But when he came up flying slowly with all that sweat dripping from his fro, we all knew he was getting ready to get some time on whatever obstacle course we had. After he came out of the super mode to walk like a real human, he grabbed four trays of sushi and started jumping down like no one else. Then a damn butterfly came to sit on his fro. 
I do have to admit, Max Musk is very much like pollen. The butterfly sat for a second before it got too wet, then went to the rail to get its legs dry. We all laughed, but as the day went on, we all saw more butterflies come and land on us like we were invading their space. Where were they at yesterday, though? So, about this obstacle course to end all obstacle courses. We were all driven to the closest mountain. It was a good hour drive because we had to go out of the national port because they didn't want to desecrate him. We enjoyed seeing civilization for a while until we pull up into the mountain and finally go over this hill to see the obstacle course. Like a rainbow. It was set up like a rainbow. It was mad long too. But just to do it the way I like to do it, we are going to call this Rainbow Road today. Rainbow Road was long and it had so many stories. At one point, one of the buildings had seven stories. This is supposed to be a vacation, not a televised event. The drivers of the shuttle decided to drive us along the whole cliffside so we could see how long the course was. It was six buildings with seven stretches of outside stuff. My ankle started to hurt as soon as I... <laughs> <laughs> my ankle started to hurt as soon as I did the math in my head. Then everyone who was in the front of the shuttle I was on started laughing because of how I was adding things up. I started off silent, then Raphoon asked me what I was doing when I started mumbling. I told him, and then he started to pay more attention to me, and as I was adding up more sprints and more muscle figure, I sounded like I needed a medic as soon as I would have to step off of the shuttle. Ouching to the watching. When the seven colored shuttles finally got dropped off at the beginning of the course, I had the luxury of being walked to the starting line by my green-haired mutant of a man. I was already acting like I couldn't walk because I knew that I'm eventually going to need a wheelchair again. There we were, with the rest of the team, the lovers and the supporters. Everyone had on their colors, everyone had bottles of water, everyone was stretching. The course was started at noon. We had enough time to go over everything of Rainbow Road. Want to read it? Well, here you go. Rainbow Road is set up as follows. One mile of asphalt to the first building. First building is set up as a two-story spiderweb course, where we had to climb from the first floor all the way to the opening in the second floor. It was a total distance of a half a mile. No telling how much rope was used to set this course up. The exit was a long slant. One mile of gravel to the second building. Second building is set up as a two-story mirror maze. The mirrors were all two stories high, but there were seven different segments with interchanging walls. No telling when each wall moved, but every time they moved, they changed everyone's course through it. We couldn't see the other teams. We could only see ourselves. One mile of colored turf to the third building. Third building is a four-story building with trampolines that get you from one floor to the other. This was tricky because a lot of people did not want to break their legs fucking around with these trampolines. The exit allowed us to go down spiral stairs. One mile of colored turf and water sprinklers to the fourth building. Fourth building is a three-story building that acted like a rest obstacle. It simply had escalators with chairs that allowed everyone to sit down and ride it up. Now everyone wanted to run their guts out today. Amazingly, every team just sat down and waited out the 30 minutes it took for an entire ride up to the third floor. The exit was another set of spiral stairs. One mile of three and a half football pits to the fifth building. Fifth building is a three-story building that acted like the biggest obstacle of them all. It was nothing but a huge gladiator phenomenon that made everyone happy at the sight of it. It was quite miraculous, but wasn't sectioned off. Everyone had to go through the entire direct maze and get to go down a fun slide into another stretch for the final building. One mile of mud to the sixth building. Sixth building is the tallest of them all. The seven-story building that had seven flights of stairs that all varied in different shapes. That's all we had to do was climb the stairs up to the last floor. It was horrendous, but at least the first set of stairs were the hardest to deal with. But we were all out of breath by the time we got to the top. Yet... It was a glorious water slide we were all looking forward to. Seven stories down of a huge ass slide that allowed us to glide across the water at the bottom and get all of the mud off of us. One mile of trampolines to the finish line. I wanted to win so badly today that I kept screaming at everyone during the gladiator bit to get in gear to steam ahead in it. We were able to break away from all of the packs to the final building where I was the last one to go down the slide. Then that's when I finally started seeing the other teams try to catch up with us. 
I waved bye bye to Jubilation Lane and the many other men that came up the final staircase, then slid down to victory. The orange team were the victors, with the indigo team coming in second and the red team coming in third. I screamed for a minute just for kicks when I crossed the finish line. Rafoon came over to me like I really needed it. <laughs> Rafoon came over to me like I really needed it because instead of walking it out, I instantly fell to my knees and screamed Medi. It was all good and fun, but we all cheered that they had shower containers around the bend where the shuttles were. On one side, we got to wash the sweat and tears off. The other side had food waiting for us. We all limped to the cafeteria, then limped to the shuttles, making fun of each other, but the day wasn't over yet. When we got back to the campgrounds, we walked upon a huge swarm of butterflies flying in all kinds of directions over the lake. I'm really getting tired of these butterflies wilding in the way that they were. At one point, I saw them drinking somebody's milkshake. A little butterfly get in my personal space and around my food. They were non-stop today too. Even when the sun went down and we went to go paint that giant designated tree with non-toxic paint. They just floated around to watch us. Then at one point, when it seemed like all of them were disappearing to go to sleep or whatever butterflies are supposed to do when the sun isn't out, they flew high to sit on branches and we could all see their eyes watching us paint this tree. I think everyone got a little paranoid, but Rafoon took my focus off of them when he splashed me with a can of paint, then hit me with another can of paint, just so he can call me cotton candy coated caramel. Don't ever ask me why I write the way I write. So, I was trying not to smile so hard. My cheeks got so big because all I could do was make them big and stare into nothingness as everyone left. I ended up letting everyone know that I'll be hating them for the rest of the night. Day 4. I wake up to the sight of Rafoon simply smiling at me with his back turned. He crawls back into the sleeping bag with me, kisses my forehead, and then squeezes the bejesus out of me like I'm going to disappear or something. I disappeared alright. It was Mexican day. Time to get some caramel apple empanadas. I was all over the motherfuckers at breakfast like I was going to disappear or something. Then something happened. Somebody went missing. The park rangers came around to ask questions because one of the random people who happened to be there with us was claiming that her boyfriend went missing sometime during the night. Good. We needed somebody to disappear from the red team because they were claiming that they were going to kill the scavenger hunt and I didn't want to die today. <laughs> I'm done with making jokes. So then the scavenger hunt got canceled because the park rangers were afraid that people were missing again. This was news to me because I haven't heard anything about anyone disappearing on my personal plate. Side note, the National TPB plate of the Tristone era is a whole planet that was specifically built by me and the God Afterlife. And I usually know everything that's happening on it, but obviously I don't know what's happening at Romeo National Park. So, yet, they said it's been happening for a decade that random people come up missing without a trace. Now that I'm here, I have no choice but to figure it out. Only after I stuffed my face with Mexican food. Jubilation Lay and Rafoon were the only people that waited for me to solely eat and savor the breakfast delicacies. They laughed when I finally got down with the buffet. Then we went to see what the fuss was about. The park rangers gave me the 411 on everything that happened around the disappearances. It was always random with who disappeared, from children to adults to super beings to whatever. Everything was different about them and they couldn't connect anything but it was always a disappearance that dealt with these campgrounds. Out of the 27 whopping disappearances that never were acknowledged by me because authorities never brought them to my attention, only two of them were employees. After we wasted a few hours trying to piece together anything with details they had, Mac had the nerve to tell us that something isn't right about here, and he's been seeing it ever since we got here. Oh, thank you Mr. Laser Vision for finally speaking up. Talking about he can see invisible bodies of people. The people who all disappeared. Mac. Get out and go get the rest of Jude and Mice. Always fucking up. And he know I didn't like them butterflies. But he said it's not the butterflies. Side note. Jude and Mice is the group that Mac belongs to. And it's a guardian group of 
the real be for real story um and all man guardian groom i told him to prove it but there were no butterflies around to fuck with i told him he was lucky but with him only being a laser welder out here there was no way of using anyone's vision abilities to put his theories to the test at this point i didn't want the disappearances to take place so we could be on the scavenger hunt minding our business and not having this on my conscience then I started to think about the girl and how she was worried about her boyfriend and his entire family. She was worrying hard. Everyone was trying to console her, but with no leads on those disappearances. She knew she would have to get a family the bad news. After noonish, I found her near the water skis, just sitting on one thinking. I knew she only wanted to clear her mind for a while, but I asked her to wait. She was just about to fasten the final one. Then her sore eyes simply looked at me to acknowledge me. I asked her what was her least favorite thing about him. She answered quickly and candidly. Gosh, he would push me out of bed just to get us going in the morning. I hated it, but it was the only thing that got me out of bed. I don't even know how I got out of bed this morning. I'm sure her life would be horrible for a long time after this. I didn't ask her how long they have been dating because everyone was saying they've been together for a couple of years. I simply told her to not tell his family anything until I see what this shit is about. She told me okay, then fastened the lifeguard vest so she could go out on the water slowly. Her energy was so out of weight, it made mine out of weight. When I got back to camp, everyone was waiting on me. All I could think of was, where are them damn butterflies? No one had seen any of them, so I asked everyone to go out into the forest with me. We have to find their swarm of butterflies. But in the records, there haven't been a mass amount of a lot of things every time someone has disappeared. But I can feel it in my stuff that those butterflies have something to do with this. Eventually, somebody sees one. Matt goes to looking at the ether of reality around it and sees the boyfriend. He can see the boyfriend screaming at the butterfly. Then I ask Matt to look at the butterfly in our realities. He told me to pipe in. He knows how to use his abilities. So I say... Well, excuse me for wanting you to be a stand-up protector. <laughs> oh, boy. Then he took his focus off of the butterfly slowly to look at me like I've lost my mind. Everyone saw that face palming themselves. Then saw that I laughed stupidly because he looked like he wanted to body slam me on my neck. All I could say was, no, please. Sir, please, no. I won't, I won't do it again. <laughs> then he went back to staring at the butterfly. Max said, we don't want to see what he sees. He told Twistel to create the most alluring flower to catch the attention of the butterfly. Then told Jubilation Lay to prepare to seal it in its location so he can show us what it looks like. Then he told us, never mind. He saw something that would get us all fucked up. He started reading something as the lady's eyes began to glow to prepare to do what he wanted. Matt began to word what he was reading. Flows of ether keep me protected from all senses. I have to take these people, keep these trophies so they here understand that I know what's beautiful. Keep protection spells as high as a rocket's height, just in case anyone needs to fall from a rocket's height. He didn't want to test that theory because not everyone in this group is a super being. He had all nine super beings. I tell it back to the camp. Twistel put out this giant lovely fuchsia and orange colored flower that smelled like a dessert buffet. I instantly said, hold up. I want some of this shit. Everybody said, focus. Together. Then a butterfly instantly came over to get on the flower as we were all staring at the flower. It had glowing pollen. The butterfly literally didn't know how to act. It was all over the flower, moving in slow motion, and we can't tell if it was staring at us or caught up in the scent that's the flower. Mac told us that we were about to see one of the most ugly things we've ever seen in our lives. I wanted to joke about him having an awful life because of his vision abilities, but Rafoon quickly grabbed my hand and shook his head. We have no idea what Mac saw, and I'm sure we wouldn't all be prepared for it. He nodded at Jubilation to trap him. She trapped it, all right? But it was so humongous, all we could do was wonder how a monster did look like a damn spinner from Borderlands made itself look like a butterfly. A beautiful butterfly. It was horrendously ugly like something out of a horror flea. 
It had a messed up doll face that moved at the speed of light but also entered slow motion randomly as it moved at the core and looked like an unnatural being with six legs that were either on the ground or on a tree or slowly dangling in the air. With it being captivated by Twistel's power, it couldn't tell that we were staring at it in disgust. Then Max said that its latest victim is coming over here to scream at it again. Without any of us being sorcerers or able to see it unless Matt gives us a lens in order to do so, we can't do anything about it, and no one here can read lips. I told Jubilation Lady to kill it without hesitation. She melted the monster into a stale's gorgeous flower. The wind carried the ash out of there, but we were thankful that no other butterflies were in the region. Before the night was over, we tried to get in touch with any spellbinder that could help us out with doing something about all of the missing people. Everyone was saying something about being two days out of range because their schedules were tied up, but I can't force any of them to do anything since my characters are their own people. We were stuck in Romeo Port, kind of scared out of our minds because that monster was fucking horrible looking. But the words that Max said meant that we were dealing with an entity that has infiltrated the Tristone era without a fault until now. We didn't know its power level, but we all chalked it up to being a female at least. Mac kept bugging Kato Rez and Rasez to come do something about it, while Universe was bugging the Bejesus out of Nova Rica, Ella Soul, and the Source, but they weren't replying because they were scheduled to be in other universes. Side note, those characters listed are in the groups of Mac and Universe. Back to the story. Twistel said that none of the Genii were available because they were too busy enjoying a booze fest for the next three weeks. All we could do was hope that no one else would disappear. And Jedi is another word for genie. And Twistel comes from a story with a lot of them. And Day 5. Yep, more disappearances. What we did in the forest yesterday caused whatever it was to enter a state of shambles and rebellion. We woke up to a lot of disarray as we tried to get whatever rations were out there, courtesy of the park rangers. The park rangers were saying that the butterflies have been swarming around, cutting down trees, and a lot of their personnel have disappeared since sunrise. Mac immediately asked for all personnel that are super beings, and then gave the three of them the lens he gave us yesterday, so we can see their true form. Into the forest, we went with superpowers ready to go. I stared at Rafoon as he magically turned his flesh into mecha form, floated, and then quickly flew into the forest, leaving us all behind. I screamed at him to not go full super being on this national park. Then he came back instantly with a, my bad. All I could do was grab his mecha form by the face and kiss him. To his reaction of instantly turning back to flesh to savor the kiss and him saying, we should go do something real quick before we go out there to save lives. Rafoon played too much. I think I kissed him about 11 more times before I released him to get down to business. Twistel was like, I can't wait to get back home to my man. We all laughed as Rafoon zoomed off a lot slower than he did before. Eventually, we started to hear the shrieks of the monsters that we were killing because not all of us had lava powers like Jubilation Lee to instantly melt anything in our sight. Their bodies were chopped and screwed, but at least you could focus on our faces this time. With their bodies being inanimate, you can see that it looks like a very pale-skinned Asian woman. It must be her behind it, but without a psychic around, we can't do anything about these monsters' source. With me being an all superpower wielder, I can use sound to penetrate the ether of reality to incubus her out of wherever she's hiding. I clear my throat, then with my glowing vocal cords, I say, Whoever you are, the ugly mating of these spinning monsters running around, garbing people in invisible eek, get your dirty ass out there. Then there she was. All of us were surrounding her as she came walking out of whatever door she summoned. Looked around trying to figure out the heavenly voice that called her. I signaled her to look at me. Then I put her down on the ground with my powers while Twistel made her breathe in vegetation that would allow her complete control of a host. Twistel made her stand up then said, Do everything I ask of you and I won't have to do you like this. Right in the kissing. Twistel smacked her so hard her neck should have broke. The blood coming out of her mouth was an indicator that her teeth might not function the same anymore. 
This interrogation may only go so far because she could be a controller of monsters or a spellbinder. We didn't want to find out. The mind control eventually led us to believe that we were talking to Fung Chi Feng. She said she was trying to get a man to believe in her power so that he would marry her. We all thought why on earth would she go about it in this fashion only to find out that he is this evil serial killer no one knows about. She admits that none of the people she has hid from plain sight are dead. They don't even know what she looks like, let alone what's going on. But they are going crazy, but not yet crazy enough to give to the man of her dreams. For some odd reason, he likes to execute people in a dirty fashion, who happen to be deranged in solitude to the point that their deer in the head likes look leads them into only sustaining by having food and a tube forced into their body. The psychological damage that he craves is in their gray matter, and he is exposed at the site in which they are left. The psychological damage that he craves is in their gray matter and is exposed at the site in which they are left. With their heads wide open and a brain being on display with needles indicating points towards how their mind is actually connected to their bodies. Out of the 27 victims she has taken, none of them have given up hope on getting out of whatever dimension she put them in. No telling where they are. Because if dude was trying to talk to a butterfly to get back to reality, the others have probably traversed the galaxy to an extent. We all never needed a spellbinder so bad in our lives, then instantly she disappeared. We figured we must have not had her actual body, we must have had a decoy. Jubilation didn't enact her seal powers, we lost her. But Jubilation didn't like the sound of everything, so she followed her then brought her out of another dimension then kept plucking until there were five versions of her. Equian, Universe, Raphoon, Mac and I snapped their necks, but it turned out that it wasn't their real bodies. One of the park rangers is a zombie wielder. He couldn't reanimate the bodies. They were fake. We still want to spellbind her badly. There was nothing my powers could do against monster creation or spellbinding, but this was clearly the work of a spellbinder. Our killing spree had to continue after that. At least 80 supposed butterflies were slain and turned into ash throughout day 5. Day 6. We wake up to good news about Fung Chi Feng and her history. We find out about her obsession with death and then getting caught up with several different types of killers and serial killers. We couldn't pinpoint which one she is trying to devote her killing career to, but we have to put an end to it. I have a whole bottle of Hennessy to myself as we brainstorm what needs to be done to try to trick her into actually exposing her true self. Some of the intel prove that she is a hexing wielder. I can do a little anti-hexing trickery by myself, but I can't negate full-on spells. But I need to finish this whole bottle of Hennessy and my breakfast before we head out to hunt her down again. Jubilation Lady ends up turning more of the monsters to ash as she leads the search party through the forest. Mac is steadily looking for her escape route, but he doesn't see anything, and neither do we, because we still have his vision assistance on deck. We get to a further part of the forest our entire group hasn't seen. Raphoon has been zooming through the forest much faster than everyone. Then he sees some shit he thinks Mac should see. He grabs Mac, then the two of them disappear slowly, so we know what direction they are going in. We go into super being mode, then zip throughout the forest for a moment before catching up to them. Everyone immediately notices this clearing behind two almost identical trees because the air between them is glimmering as if someone is holding giant pieces of glitter. Raphoon and Mac are talking shit while we are arriving one by one. Then Raphoon asks him does he want to do the honors. Mac reveals the door. Then all hell breaks loose. With us being super beings, we were able to get the three part rangers out of there without them being decimated like the trees around. This monster was different, a guardian. Taking it out would be difficult compared to the lesser monster type we've had to deal with. It was shooting out huge blade cannons that seemed to have a range of 25 feet directly within its vicinity. With it being like a 50 foot version of humans, it only peeked its head and arms out of the door. Instead of emerging from it, Equan started charging super power blocks of bronze metal that seemed to negate his blade attacks. When he figured out the opening, he teleported directly over the head, about a good 200 feet above him, then super plummeted to the ground to stop directly in the brain matter of the monster. Once he connected, he super spin, then erupted with enough energy to behead the monster, but he didn't have to do it so hard that the shoulders exploded too, and his arms fell off. 
that created unnecessary flesh in the atmosphere that we could have done without him. He made a joke about we are surrounded by trees and to still can help with the aroma too. But we didn't really need all of that in our noses. I pretended to grab nasal spray while I backed away from the area. Eventually, we deliberated who was going to be the one to lead the search party. The park rangers volunteered, but we felt like they weren't powerful enough and I didn't want Raffoon to get killed fucking around with this spellbinder. He hasn't died since arriving to the Tristone era, and today definitely won't be the day. He was ready to get things going, but Jubilation said she'd go if Universe backs up in hurricane form. Everyone asks why, because that would just create an unnecessary mess we'd probably be spending days going through. She explained with it being done that way, everyone will be saved, and any of those who have died will be resurrected anyway. We all agreed, then the two of them went in after the universe instantly transformed into a controlled whirlwind. After they went in the door, I started dancing because I caught the beat of tweets, somebody else will. Raphon told me now is not the time for a jam session. It wasn't, but I couldn't help it. Jubilation Lay in Universe ended up in a mansion. A crooked mansion that looked ice cold like the heart of who it's on to. It was easy for them to pick up on her body. She was the only one home. She was on the third floor in a sunroom, laying down on the floor with her eyes closed. Jubilation ran into the room, pounded her into the ground, flipped her over, then held her by the back of the neck so she could start demanding shit. Every time Fung Chi said no, Jubilation hit her with some heat that disallowed her to think with spells so she couldn't manifest any danger. Jubilation kept telling her to think about her questions, not to think about getting away. Universe eventually entered a state of control by turning into a gust of wind, then entering her body through her nose. Once inside, he was able to make her dispel herself completely while finding out the location of her spell book so he can keep her from doing any damage. Jubilation asked Universe if she could smack her. He said, of course, he was air after all. Before she could strike her, Fung Chi pushed Jubilation to a wall and went to do something else, but Jubilation instantly teleported back to her before she could connect to the wall to hit her so hard. She turned her into a human tornado. Universe was laughing on the inside because he went right into Twister Vision that made her body stay up as it went unconscious. Jubilation created a lava form to go to the magical door to signal for everyone else to come in. Then continued to send lava bodies every five seconds until everyone was in the sun room. Once we all got there, we never wanted a psychic so badly. But Universe had his way of controlling bodies in gust form. He was able to render Fung Chi conscious. She slowly realized that she was unable to fight her way out of this situation. Later on in the day, when Super Being Spellbinders of the TPP plate finally got around to getting there, they were able to dispel her cloaking and invisibility ways. It will only be a matter of time before the victims emerge from their captivity and for the spellbinders to find a few that were actually killed for resurrection. We saved some lives, but we still hadn't figured out how she was able to slide under the radar for this many years of activity. She was taken to where she needed to be. Oopsies, maximized containment facility. There was a cell specially crafted for her with her spell book on the mantel near the door to the cell. Even though our little trip was ruined by this time, we were able to relax before sunset. A heavy amount of booze was delivered, thanks to one of my portal wielders, feeling the need to help us celebrate. She decided to stay with us as we lounged out on the deck with no giant butterflies in sight. Day 7. We all wake up feeling grand from all of the adventuring we did yesterday. We all decided to continue with the schedule of the trip, but it wasn't the same because we missed days of competition. We all wake up feeling grand from all of the adventuring we did yesterday. We all decided to continue with the schedule of the trip, but it wasn't the same because we missed days of competition. We went along with the all-day hike, which had us in a different region of the forest, camping out for the night. We spent the night dipping marshmallows in deadly concoctions of alcoholism. Had the bonfire a little too lit as everyone kept it splendid. Raphon was in my arms at one point. We were the furthest away from the bonfire. He told me that I lived in a crazy world. I told him I definitely live in a crazy world, and as long as we are here, you will be protected. He asked, like, right now? I laughed, then he laughed. I squeezed his left pick like I meant it, then hummed as I kissed the top of his dome. He asked about the largest threat level that has gotten under the radar the longest. 
I told him that there's no telling. After I stopped creating my stories, my characters took life in their own hands. We are now living in the seventh millennia of my imagination. No telling what Mike and Drake has in store with his infinity amounts of revenge against me. Blackness indeed has been MIA for a few centuries. There are villains that turned a new leaf. There are villains in other universes that had access to mine. Even my villains are in other universes wrecking heaven. The Silent Trees organization have also been MIA for far too long. I really need to check up on them, but no one knows where they are, unlike blackness indeed. I ended up telling him that what I created has a mind of their own. I no longer own them. They no longer loathe me. I did have a strong issue with all of the versions of myself I created. He said I sure did. He remembered those classes about the beginning of story number 10, the man's memorial stones, because he saw more than a dozen of me and how they reacted to me. He thought the entire situation was called for. But still funny how all of them say Indian style around me like I better join in on the Zen session. He always has jokes and I always love them. I eventually got our sleeping bags, then built a little barrier around us as we fell asleep with the gentle night air caressing our faces. The final day. When everyone got back to camp after that silent bus ride, we walked into a pancake thon that was sweeter than anything I've ever had in my mouth. Boys and bears syrup was everywhere. I mean everywhere. I slowly ate pancakes because I didn't want the morning to end, but when it finally ended, we went to our little room to get our things so we could get to the carving tree with the contraction bit around it so we could go to the next highest mark on the legendary tree. We were given our tools so we could engrave the tree. Raphoon and I watched each other create a yin and yang like design where his swirl into the one I first did. I created a gesture. Like I'm putting out my hands to grab someone for a hug. He follows suit by creating a tattoo-esque image of hearts floating over the hands. Then we added our initials to it. Sealed it with a kiss of our own. And we both laughed at the flavor of the sap from the tree. It filled us full of glee for some odd reason. Then we shared a sweaty kiss to continue this love affair we have going on. Once we left the sweet embrace, I told him, Welcome to my world again.